Okay, we're going to do something um, really unique. We've talked about doing it before, but we haven't done it before. Uh, I have around the table here Dan Herbster, who is one of our elders at Faith Family Church, also historian for the 101st Airborne. I am Kyle Sharon, the preaching pastor at Faith Family Church. We have Kent Shepherd, uh, one of our small group leaders, also preached a faithful message last week, good word. He's also a warrant officer in the U.S. Army. So we're going to talk about the sermon today. By the way, brother, thank you for that faithful exposition. Praise the Lord. Great. We're going to talk about the sermon today, and uh, I'm going to ask you some questions, and then we're just going to we're going to talk through some things. So first, um, Kent, how, how was how was the exposition helpful for you? Well, first off, Pastor Dan, I did a phenomenal job. I mean, just so faithful, and I think you picked a great book uh, going through First John. Just that very very simple Greek, that, that Christian litmus test. Um, I, I really liked your intro, how you talked about the truth and the light and the love. And I know that you, you said you don't care very much for alliterations, but when you broke it down with the age, the antichrist, the anointed, you're able to take you know quite a few verses of scripture and break them up into tangible chunks that we can look at, really reflect upon ourselves, how are we standing for truth, what's the age that's going, going on that we're currently living in, and how should the anointed respond to that? So phenomenal message. It was really, really a blessing to me. Praise the Lord. I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that was helpful because that honestly I find that this is the hardest part. It's finding a structure so that I can understand what's really there and that some people will get uh, take something away from it. And Okay, let's talk about this particular text. It's not a light one. So John poses the question, what time is it? My kids are always asking, is it dinner time? <laughs> is it dinner time? Well, John says here it's antichrist time. So throughout the text we have singular, plural going back and forth. Singular, antichrist plural antichrists with an s on the end so let's let's talk about first antichrist this pseudo christ that was in the text this devil's darling this satanic superman and um you know the question that's often answered and addressed during this text is who is the antichrist and people have had made all kinds of wild and strange speculations as to who he is i've heard uh, franklin t roosevelt I've heard Mussolini. I've heard the Antichrist was Hitler, Stalin. I've heard the Antichrist was uh, Bill Clinton. I've heard the Antichrist was the Pope, many different popes. Uh, every U.S. president has been on the suspect list for the Antichrist. It is interesting, church family, to know that the Antichrist is male. So, um, Ladies, yes. you're off the hook. There exactly. you go. Yeah. Exactly. I... It's, a, it's a male. Uh, I wanted to read this to you specifically, uh, Dan. John F. Kennedy was a particular candidate for the Antichrist. He was the first Roman Catholic president. He was believed to move according to the Pope's bidding. In the, 1950s, in the 1956, at the Democratic Convention, he received, get this, 666 votes. Tragically, Kennedy was shot in Dallas, and many people waited for him to return from the dead to prove his true identity as the Antichrist. So the wild speculations are everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, even our last president, President Barack Obama, um, on a Sunday before Barack Obama's election, Robert Jeffers, who is a pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas, a Southern Baptist Church, said that if President Obama were elected, his victory would lead to the reign of the Antichrist. And I have a quote here. He said, I want you to hear me tonight. I'm not saying that President Obama is the Antichrist. I'm not saying that at all. One reason I know he's not the Antichrist is that the Antichrist is going to have much higher numbers, poll numbers, when he comes. President Obama is not the Antichrist, but what I am saying is this. He is choosing to lead our nation, paving the way for the future reign of the Antichrist. And, of course, he and others have pointed out that the daily pick three lottery number in Obama's home state of Illinois the day after was 666. So these are just wild and crazy speculations. And I am so glad that you are here to answer exactly for us who is the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's going to be a really easy dodge because we don't know. Uh, and we probably won't know uh, exactly uh, till it, it happens and the Lord's about to come. Uh, but th there's a, like you've said, throughout church history, there have been all kinds of speculations about who it is. And that the whole point here is not to, to uh, predict or accuse a particular person or anyone of being uh, the lesser antichrist. The point is that we need to be cautious. We need to be wary against false teaching. 
Um, and then we just uh, trust in the sovereignty of God about as far as how world events are going to play out. Uh, that's the way we've always been. It's not exactly an exciting answer because a lot of times when we have these prophecies, whether it's the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel that you've been going through so faithfully, we often want to, and even rightly so, intellectually we were curious about how these things could play out. But the point of, of Revelation is not to help us understand exactly how things are going to work out. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's a warning for those who uh, rebel against Christ, and it's an encouragement for those who are Christians that they will be vindicated, that they are on the winning side. And the same thing with uh, the Antichrist. The Bible gives us enough to guess that there will be an ultimate Antichrist who will likely be some sort of world political leader or religious leader or some combination of the two. But just like the second return of Christ, Christ says, my coming is going to be like lightning in the sky. What he's saying is, you don't have to speculate whether it's happened or not. It's going to be obvious. So if there's any doubt whatsoever, you don't. And the whole point of identifying, of being warned about antichrists, plural, is not to accuse this or that false teacher of being an antichrist or this world leader. It is to be on guard. And sure, when someone's clearly a false teacher, we need to be warned about that. But it, it, the, the whole teaching on Antichrist is not for speculation. It is for warning and ultimately for encouragement to know that if we're in Christ, we are on the winning side. That's good. So we'll jump to Antichrist plural in just a moment. But do you have anything else to add, Antichrist, since he didn't give us an answer? Do you, do you know who it <laughs> good is? Good political answer. No, no I absolutely yep. don't know. Um, but, you know, spoiler alert, in the end, Jesus wins. And yes. uh, Satan's going to be cast into the lake of fire. So we yes. look at the book of Revelation with a blessed hope, no, mm. knowing that he conquers and that we have got that future reign of Christ that we can be united with him forever for eternity. Amen. So we all agree that it is unwise for a pastor or anyone to say a particular person is the Antichrist. Correct. Would we agree I'd agree. That? I would totally okay. agree. So I, I probably shouldn't teach my children that Nick Saban. Yeah. <laughs> right? I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. Or Tom yes. Brady. Yeah. I would okay. discourage you against that, okay, brother. Good. Yeah. All right. Now let's go to the plural aspect of it. Throughout the text you preached this morning, uh, it mentioned antichrist, and so this is this is a unique word. I think probably John coined this particular word. Um, this is not a 21st century phenomenon. So when we talk about antichrist, this isn't something that we just have here. The first century church was facing this as well. So c- kind of what threw me in a in a positive way when you were preaching was um, antichrists are everywhere, and, and so it could I actually be shaking hands with someone in church? or at an event, and, and they are antichrist. I mean, they're not going to come up to me and say, hello, I'm, I'm an antichrist. I'm one of them. They're not going to have a pitchfork and, and horns. But wh- where are these antichrists? Uh, could they be speaking at conferences? Are they Satan's missionaries? What- well, uh, based on all the passages uh, that I looked at that refer to the antichrist or that principle, they certainly can be dangerous from without the church, but based on today's passage, clearly one uh, threat is from within as well, because he talks about they were part of us. They were enjoying Christian community, probably like the passages in Hebrews where people were, are enjoying some aspect of the Christian community, but they fall away because they weren't truly Christians. Uh, so there is that threat of people on the inside. Now again, similar to the ultimate antichrist, the purpose of this passage is not to accuse people in the church or in other uh, church denominations of being an antichrist, although uh, it's important to talk about the truth and evaluate people's teachings by the word of God. But yes, the, the whole point is to be cautious so that uh, we, we realize that there are people who claim to be Christians could lead us astray and so that all of us have a, an obligation to be discerning uh, regarding false teaching and false teachers. You have any thoughts on that, Kent? So when, when you talk to somebody who professes faith in Christ and then we, we ask them, like, you know, how can we tell if somebody is truly a born-again believer? Of course, you've got the fruit component of their faith, but then there's the perseverance. Are they continuing to walk with Christ? Are they continuing to demonstrate that they are a born-again believer? And the same um, kind of methodology can be applied towards these antichrists. Like they may come in, they may have an orthodox um, belief at first, but the, the longer they go, you begin to see they, they start having that errant theology. And, and as John has that litmus test, he said that, um, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. So certainly there, there is an aspect that people may be in a, in a point of, 
starting to go in towards errant theology. We may be shaking hands with them. We may be, you know, welcoming them into the church. But over time, if they are going that route, they're going to be, begin to show that they've got rotten fruit, um, that their theology doesn't align with ours. And the more that we proclaim truth, they will begin to separate themselves from us. Yeah. And, of course, it kind of raises an implication. I didn't harp, I just kind of alluded to it, but I didn't have time to go into this. This is one of the many reasons we do church discipline at this church. And folks who've been through our membership class know that uh, the, the reason we do that is out of a heart of love. If someone Absolutely. either is straying away in their teaching from Christianity or their lifestyle is, is showing evidence that they are uh, blatantly disobeying Christ, we have an obligation as, as church members to pursue them in love, to seek reconciliation and repentance. And if not, we remove them lovingly from our membership roles with the hope that that would uh, cause them to, to repent and return. Right. And so the, the role of pastor um, mm. in Greek, it is a shepherd. Exactly. So, you know, we're called to shepherd the flock, but there's times where we have to fend off from the wolves that are coming in trying mm -hmm. to take away our sheep. So. Uh, when you start to see people coming and teaching Aaron theology, we have to stop them in their tracks and let them know that that's not going to fly in the church. Exactly. Good. So would it, would it be fair, I'm asking, would, would it be fair to say that wolves and antichrist, plural, are synonymous or... I'm not sure I would say that. As I, as, I was going, as I was studying for this sermon, I thought, like, well, are, are basically antichrist the same thing as any run-of-the-mill uh, false teacher? Is, there, is anyone who isn't a believer in one sense an antichrist because by their lifestyle, by what they believe, they're, they're opposing Christ in some shape, manner, or form? So I, I'm, I'm not, and I'm just, at the end of the day, I'm just not exactly sure if, it, if uh, it's, we need to do that. We just know that there, there's, a, there's a force, a spirit of opposition to Christ. It often manifests itself in particular people in a special way. But uh, even that, whether every non-believer is an antichrist or every false teacher, I'm not sure we need to know. We just need to, I think the whole point is just to be warned, to be discerning and to be warned. That's good. So the antichrist singular is coming to deceive. The antichrist plural is coming to distort. And obviously, they're distorting the message, and mm -hmm. we should not be surprised if they're in the church, or we should not be surprised if they're affecting people that are in the church. So, Kent, what, what would you do if there's an anti-Christ plural or false teacher, or someone that is polluting, they mm. are trying to ravage the sheep? What, mm. what would be an appropriate response to that? So, I, I guess it would depend on the context. Um, if it's somebody that you begin to see who has errant theology and, and they're not kind of, certainly they shouldn't be in a leadership position, but you go to them one-on-one -on -one and you talk to them, hey, brother, this is where you're kind of going astray, that mm -hmm. this is a doctrine that we've been fighting over for the past 1,800 years. We had church councils way back <laughs> yes. in the day that counseled that down, uh, that, that cast that down and said it's heresy. And you try to get them on the, on the track of orthodoxy. Now, if they start to speak in a public setting, you know, if I'm in my small group and I'm leading my folks and somebody chimes in and they start dropping heresy, mm -hmm. I've got the responsibility yes. to stop them in their tracks right. and to say, no, that does not fly. That, that's, that's heresy. We, yes. we need to get back online here. So it just depends on the context and, and really their sphere of influence and, and how they're kind of propagating that, that false truth. That's good. So in every text, especially in Old Testament text, we want to... Um, make it Christ-centered. We're not making it Christ-centered. We're recognizing that Christ completes this particular mm -hmm. text in this Old Testament story fits somewhere in the unfolding drama of redemption. Now, this is a, a New Testament book, so obviously it speaks clearly to Christ, but one of the ways you got to Christ, uh, I want Kent to kind of, kind of speak on, um, all throughout the text, there was an antichrist with his antichrist, plural, but how, how, did, um, how did Herbster spin that to make it Christ-centered? Oh, well, he contrasted, and I, I just thought it was a phenomenal contrast when he said that there's the Antichrist singular, there's the Christ singular, and then you've got your Antichrist mm -hmm. plural with the Christians. So using that contrast and looking at it, that we've got a bunch of Christians who are supposed to be little Christ, pictures of Christ that are going forward in the world, that there yes. are going to be types of the Antichrist. They, they may not be that specific person, but they represent a component mm -hmm. of um, the, the, the heresy or that distortion or that, that perversion of truth that he's trying to spread. Yes, that's excellent. Okay, and then towards the end, we'll finish up here, but you had three applications. Uh, one of them I really loved. I liked them all, but one of them <laughs> I really liked, um, tr truth matters, and just that emphasis of what are we doing with our time in this coronavirus, mm -hmm. this COVID-19 time period. Are we just binge watching on Netflix, or do yes. we have some time in there for you yes. know scripture reading? Or, I mean, wait, do we yeah. have time for both? 
I mean, because I'm binge watching. I, I, find, I well. find a way to do both. So, you know, that's, I think each person needs to discern that on their own. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, we need to take advantage. And why is it when we have the most free time that mm. we are the least disciplined? Yep. Mm. You know, and so, let, you know, finding times, and we, we want to give our, our people some time here. Do you have anything to add on the first application, Truth Matters, before we get to the second? So, something I always tell people is we shouldn't major in the minors. Mm. And so, if you're always focusing on the minors and mm. what that stuff is looking like, we, we have to know what the true doctrine, the true, go, true oh, gospel, the, the things of the faith that we have to defend. If we know that, then we're, we're easily, um, we're able to discern mm. when those false falsehoods come into the church. Best, best illustration of that I've ever heard is that uh, f for training bank tellers to spot counterfeits, yes. the, the best way is not to expose them to lots of counterfeits, but to make them know the real thing so well That's right. that they can, they can spot a counterfeit. I think that, I don't know, I've heard that used, I'm not the first person to come up with that, but I think it's a great way to know that, I mean, there's some benefit in studying different cults or false teachings out there, but the most important thing, read your Bible. Study your Bible, listen to good teaching, that's going to do you the most yes. good. Yeah, that's great. Second application, the spirit is real. So um, we, we, we folks who are more doctrinally inclined, I think, need to be reminded of yeah. that every yeah. now and then. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's just people that are reformed, that sure. have a high yeah. view of the sovereignty of God. Not that everybody in the church is reformed, right. of course. People that have yeah. a high view of the sovereignty of God, um, they, they tend to neglect neglect the, the spirit's power or at least it comes it comes across that way sure. so we, we don't want to be we don't want to be guilty of that but this is uh, just as the first application was huge people can go mm. off on tangents that as Kent you said that were not the main core doctrines mm -hmm. you know they can go yeah. off on endless speculations but the second application um, people can place such an emphasis on the spirit that you wonder if there are other members of the Trinity, and could you could you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, one of my favorite quotes from John MacArthur is, is he said, "If you show me a church who is obsessed with the Holy Spirit, I will show you a church that does not have Him, uh, because the function of the Holy Spirit is to point us to Christ and not to Himself. So, we have to really understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit and how He's influencing us, informing our conscience, and comforting us, guiding us, growing us into into Christ's image and our sanctification. So. Yes, he, he is within us, he, he indwells us, but um, it's, it's not for chaos. We should have a sober view of what the Holy Spirit does in each of us and understand that he's there to, to, to keep us uh, persevering. Um, so does, um, would, does Jesus and God shine the spotlight on the Holy Spirit, or how, do, how does that work biblically? So biblically, the Holy Spirit shines a spotlight on Christ. And, and then Christ reveals the Father to us. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a progression of sorts and that, you know, regeneration is a function of the Holy Spirit, that he makes us mm -hmm. new and, and he keeps us. Um, so, it, yeah, I, I think it's got that, that proper flow. But it, in the Trinity, um, all of them work together um, as the Godhead. All yes. of them have specific roles and functions. And I'm not going to come out and do a, a whole Systematic, theology yeah, yes. of, of the Trinity. Um, we'll be here all day, but yeah. Yes, that's good. That's great. And the spirit is real. And I thought this was, this was in, interesting as well. Your last application, the last hour, um, and are we living in the last hour? What are some implications of that? What comfort do we have knowing that we could be facing some difficult, knowing that a lot of our people, how does, let me ask you this question, both of you. Yeah. How does this passage comfort some of our people? With, with, the, with knowing application number two, the spirit is real, and that this is the last hour. How does this passage comfort our people? We, we've got people that have lost their jobs. Mm. We have people who own their own businesses. And, and they're not going to, it's not going to mess them up missing a month of, of checks. But they have, they're having to lay off their employees. Mm -hmm. And that's difficult for yeah. them. We have people, maybe husbands and wives that are at home. And this is the first time they've spent some time together in a long time, and they found out, man, my marriage isn't near as strong <laughs> as I thought it was. Um, so there's just a lot of stressful things, um, last hour type stresses mm. that we're going through. What, what are some what are some comforts from this passage, and some comforts we can pull from this? Well, yeah, I think it's just comforting to know that um, it, it doesn't make everything just warm and fuzzy. But to know that everything is proceeding according to the plan of God, to, to get geeky and quote Star Wars, you know, everything is proceeding as I have foreseen. In God, 
uh, he, everything is proceeding according to plan. That includes the, the, the difficult, the um, heartbreaking, the unjust, not because God's responsible for that, but because we live in a fallen world and in his perfect plan, he has an appointed time when everything will be uh, solved. And so we know that while we all have a great reminder that we are out of control, even despite our, our modern advances of, of humanity, we're still subject to the threats of weather like tornadoes and of germs like viruses. Um, so there's a limit to our power and our control. And we're kind of learning that as a, as a species here uh, on planet Earth. And so it, uh, hopefully it will uh, cause us to run to the rock that is higher than we are, to quote the, the psalm. And we can be comforted in knowing that everything is proceeding according to God's plan, even these difficult things. And so then it just falls on us to control what we can control, which is we can be good stewards of this. John Piper um, uh, wrote a great book called Don't Waste Your Life, and then he wrote a follow-up article on that when he was diagnosed with cancer called Don't Waste Your Cancer. We could all be asking don't waste your coronavirus. Mm -hmm. What are we doing during our downtime? Yes. What are we doing with the fear and the panic that's going on in the world today? Um, how can we be a good steward of this? This is why I love the parable of the unjust steward that the, the you preached on uh, within the last year, I believe. Where the, the point is not be crooked in, and underhanded in all your business dealings. The point is be shrewd in investing this temporary life of ours for eternal dividends, for eternal awesome. uh, investment. That's great. Do you have any thoughts on that? So I think that we have to frame the way that we interpret what's going on with uh, biblical theology of the fall and, and look at the fact that death is going to come to all of us. And, and so, you know, with the curse that went to Adam, um, God said to him that, you know, by thorns and thistles, you will work the land. By the sweat of your brow, you will, you will eat bread. And so we have to understand that there's nothing that's ever going to be easy. There's a toil that all of us are going to go through. And, and this is part of the toil. We are in a period of toil right now, toil right now that's a result of the fall. And while I think, you know, we're looking at the year 2020, medical science is phenomenal. Uh, we have a very sterile view of, of, of mortality, um, whereas 200 years ago, this would have been commonplace. This type of thing was happening all the time. So we're, we're, we're coming face to face with the fact that every single one of us are going to die. Yes. And that mortality is, is a fact for, for each of us. So in light of that, how are we then going to live mm. um, in these times to bring the most glory to Christ? Um, to see the gospel go forward rather than just, you know, get all woe is me type mindset. Yes, that's great. Well, man, I've really enjoyed this. Thank you for taking this time uh, last minute to talk about the sermon. And again, I just want to emphasize, so helpful. I feasted today. Absolutely. I haven't eaten anything physically today. But <laughs> I'm about to go back and, and eat a buffet of, of some snacks when I get home. But uh, I have feasted spiritually. And I want to thank you for faithfully doing that. Uh, our people, we're going to share the sermon today along with the podcast. Matthew will get all of that up. And one helpful thing you could do as well is just as Kent answered, this was one thing in the sermon that really helped me, helped me God ministered to me, or this was one thing about the character of God that was revealed or the Antichrist that was revealed. You may want to post that as well. Here's how I was helped from today's sermon. Uh, that way we can all share in one another's Or discuss with your families if you gather yes. together to get... Um... Yes, yep, that would be great absolutely. as well. Okay, God bless. Thank you, man. man.